Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And before we start today's podcast, here's a quick reminder that we have a Patreon. And if you need motivation to join our Patreon, Sabrina just spent the last several weeks researching the Bone Wars and reading half a dozen books and tons of other things. So if you want to show her some appreciation for all her work that you're going to hear next week in our 250th episode, which is all about the Bone Wars, then please head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I know Dino and sign up. Oh, thanks, Garrett. This week in our 249th episode, we have a bunch of news, including three new Stegosaurus skeletons, one of which is a new species. We also have some sauropod studies and new events. We also have an interview with Peter May, which is from when I swung by Research Casting International on a semi-recent visit to Toronto. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Coronasaurus. But before we get into all of that, we'd like to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Nutmeg, Taya, Stego Sophie, Ayumi, Paula Canthus, Lydia, Jackson Crawford, Sorian Brandy, Mayu, Dino Bo, Mello Stego, and Wiki. And Wiki just joined, so thank you very much. I also love that nickname. There's a lot of good nicknames in there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much to everybody. Again, we appreciate all of your support, and it's really great to see this community grow and the chats on Discord and the messages on Patreon and everything like that. So if you want to join this amazing group of people, then check out our page, patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into the news, our first article is about that new stegosaur, which was named from Morocco. And thanks to Velociraptor256 for sharing this with us. Shared it a while ago, but since we pre-recorded those episodes, we're still catching up. And this one was published by Susanna Maidment and others and published in Gondwana Research. The new stegosaur is named Adratiklet Bolafa, and the genus name is all in Berber, which is one of the many Northern African languages. It's actually kind of like a family of languages. But in any case, Adras means mountain, and Tiklet means lizard, so it's the mountain lizard. And there's also an area called like the Adras area of Morocco, so it sort of honors that space as well. And then Bulafa is after the location where it was found. Also, I think it's probably based on a city that's like five kilometers away that has kind of a similar name. It's my best guess because they didn't really specify. So Adras Ticlet was found in Morocco, a couple hundred kilometers east of Casablanca, so basically inland from Casablanca, and it lived in the middle of the Jurassic, which is about 174 to 164 million years ago. For comparison, Stegosaurus was around about 10 million years later, so this is about 10 million years younger than Stegosaurus. The authors say that Adra Ticlet is the first Stegosaur found in North Africa and, quote, the oldest definitive Stegosaur from anywhere in the world, end quote. So it's quite the significant find, being a rare Stegosaur from Africa generally, and then also being so old, it expands the whole time range of when we knew Stegosaurs were around. Although, like I said, the range on when this specimen is from is 10 million years wide, 174 to 164 million years. So we don't really know how much wider <laughs> that time range is than before. We need some better stratigraphy in that area to really nail down how old this is and therefore when the first stegosaurs seem to have started popping up. As far as I can tell, we still don't have a single ankylosaur from North Africa though. So we're going to need to find one of those, I think. Unfortunately, the find doesn't have any big plates or horns, meaning there's no thagomizer. There's none of that fun backplate situation that you usually see with stegosaurs. Is that because it's older? I think it's just because they didn't find a very complete specimen. What they did find was some neck and back vertebrae and the left humerus. So basically just a little bit of an arm and then a little bit of the back. But as you know, stegosaurs don't have plates attached directly to the spine. They just kind of grow out of the skin. So by looking at the vertebrae, you still can't really tell exactly where the plates were and they don't preserve together all the time. So unfortunately, in this case, we found the vertebrae, but not the things that were like half a foot to a foot above the vertebrae. The fact that it's so much older than other stegosaurs 
makes it likely to be its own species because we know that species only last on average for about 2 million years. So if it's 10 million years older, then you know it's likely to be its own species. But the authors also noticed differences in the shape of the vertebrae that warranted making it a new genus. So not just a new species, one notch up from that, a brand new genus, which we usually see with dinosaurs anyway. It's closely related to Dacentrurus and Miragaya. So we might assume the same layout of the narrow plates on the front half of the back and then those spike-like plates as you get closer to the tail. A lot of people are familiar with Miragaya. It's pretty cool looking. It's like a spikier version of Stegosaurus. And I'm guessing that's how you'd probably depict this one since it's supposed to be a close relative based on the vertebrae, even though we don't actually know what any of the spikes or plates look like. Adra Ticlet is more closely related to Miragaya than Kentrosaurus, even though Miragaya is from Europe and Kentrosaurus is from Southern Africa. This might be because even back then in the Middle Jurassic, the northern coast of Africa was closer to Europe than it was to Southern Africa. Plus, we know that Stegosaurus could swim from the swim tracks that we've seen. One of my favorite little factoids about <laughs> Stegosaurus. So maybe they just swam across from Europe to Africa. Or maybe there was a temporary land bridge or something that allowed it to get over to Africa. I'm not sure. I wonder how strong of a swimmer it was if it did swim. Well, I mean, if it had air sacs, it would have been pretty buoyant. And it had some decent feet on it, so it probably could have paddled pretty well. The bigger concern to me is what might have tried to eat it while it's swimming because it's pretty vulnerable. Right. <laughs> and there were some big hungry monsters in the ocean back then. Maybe if they went in herds. <laughs> Only one of them would survive like yeah. out of a whole crowd of them. Like zebra or antelope do. Yeah, maybe. You mean when they try to cross rivers as mm -hmm. like a big group? I suppose that's possible. But it might be a long way though. That's true. Back then. And Europe was basically just a series of islands. So maybe they were just swimming anyway to get from island to island. And then every once in a while ended up in Africa. They got lost. <laughs> <laughs> or a strong current sucked them southward rather than towards another island in Europe. But in any event, eventually this stegosaur wound up in Africa. I suppose we don't really know the origin of stegosaur, so it could have been the other way too. They could have started in Africa and then wound up in Europe somehow. And the authors say, quote, tantalizing but fragmentary remains and trackways suggest that Europodon diversity in Gondwana may have been as rich as that of Laurasia, and the prospects for future discoveries of new genera across Gondwana are therefore very good. End quote. In other words, we need more fossils from Africa <laughs> and maybe South America, but really Africa. There's a lot of science going on in South America. The researchers also included a paleobio map of Europata, and Europata is basically Thyrea forans minus Scalidosaurs. So, in other words, just Stegosaurs and Ankylosaurs. And on that map, Africa is almost completely blank, there's huge areas without anything. The specimens all have specimen numbers for the UK Natural History Museum, and their article emphasizes where to see Sophie, so I don't think that they're on display at the Natural History Museum, but there really isn't all that much to see anyway, because it's just that humerus and a couple of vertebrae, so compared to Sophie. <laughs> oh yeah, and that Sophie display is great. It really is. So I, yeah, I don't see them putting this on display anytime soon. They did jam a lot into that dinosaur hall though, so they might be able to sneak this in somewhere. I would say, though, based on this find and some other ones we've talked about recently, Morocco really needs a dinosaur museum. I found some resources mentioning a museum in Rabat, but it seems like the plans to build it were canceled, so I'm guessing that they still don't have a natural history museum anywhere in the country. One of the authors on the paper was from a geology department in Morocco, at least, so maybe there's some growing number of paleontologists starting up in Morocco. That would be really good especially for fans of stegosaurs and spinosaurs. And speaking of stegosaurs, we have another stegosaur story. Thanks to CB Chiefski for sharing this one with us. This one's for a pair of stegosaurs found in Montana. And this paper was written by Carrie Woodruff, Dave Trexler, and also Susanna Maidment. Susanna is a stegosaur expert, which is why she's on both of these papers. And this paper was published in Acta Paleontologica Polonica, and the article includes more details about the discovery than you usually see, which made it pretty fun to read, at least for me. The rabbit hole is right in front of you. A little bit. 
It didn't go that deep. Oh, okay. <laughs> so like I said, this article is about a pair of stegosaurs. These were both found in Montana. And unfortunately, they weren't able to tell which stegosaurs they are specifically, like whether it was Stegosaurus or Miragaya or something. Probably wouldn't be Miragaya since that's in Europe. But in any event, they were both collected on private land by the Judith River Dinosaur Institute and are both being held at the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum in Malta, Montana. And the abbreviation for that museum is GPDM. So the first dinosaur is known as GPDM 205. It's also known as Gates. And it was found in 2004 near a Camarasaurus. So at least we know one of the other dinosaurs that it was near. Although apparently this one was found above the Camarasaurus. So they might not have been there at the same time. The Gates find consists of most of the front left leg. And that's it. <laughs> so again, no plates or spikes or anything. Part of the reason we can't tell which stegosaur Gates comes from is because most stegosaurs have pretty similar legs especially their front legs. So if you only find the leg, you can tell it's a stegosaur, but it doesn't really help you to narrow it down much more than that. And for some reason, there aren't many details about its excavation. They said that there wasn't a map or any field notes from it. So maybe they were lost or someone forgot to take them. <laughs> I don't know what happened there because this was in 2004. So generally, these modern finds come with a lot of notes about where they're from. There were a couple of Hesperosaurus myosi sometimes described as Stegosaurus myosi, that were collected nearby. Unfortunately, those are all in private collections, so we can't really compare them and tell like, oh, this leg definitely comes from this other individual, and therefore it's just part of that Hesperosaurus. But we do know that some of those other private collection finds include some poorly preserved plates and other bones that are missing from this dinosaur. The other find is a little bit more exciting. It's GPDM 178, also known as Giffen, and Giffen was found about 100 miles west-northwest of Gates, pretty close to Great Falls, Montana. And a piece of Giffen's right tibia was found first, which was eroding out of a hill, also on private property, like I said earlier. So the landowner used this quote-unquote black rock as a doorstop <laughs> for a few years before they stumbled onto more bones while building a barn. Wow. Yeah. It's a fun doorstop. I mean, I guess our doorstop, as fun as doorstops get, <laughs> hopefully it didn't get too worn out in those years. True. I suppose it was already eroding out of the hill, so it might not have been the most exciting part of the find anyway. But the Giffen find is quite a bit more complete than Gates. So again, they found most of the front left leg, weirdly. I guess these front left legs in Montana just are preserved everywhere. But they also found a partial skull, several plates, the right tibia that I mentioned earlier, <laughs> eroding out of the rock and partly used as a doorstop, and some vertebrae and ribs as well. The ribs and vertebrae are apparently in, quote, several field jackets that are labeled as dorsal ribs or vertebrae and await preparation, end quote. So maybe we'll figure out the genus later, because like we talked about with Adra Ticklet, Vertebrae can be really useful in identifying a stegosaur, so hopefully we can look at those vertebrae and then figure out where this one fits in and maybe it'll be a new species, or maybe it'll just be stegosaurus because it's in the Morrison formation and they're very common in there. <laughs> we'll have to see. Most of the skull is from the upper and lower jaws, including teeth, although there is a little bit of the back top of the skull, which they could make a couple little inferences about what the brain case looked like. Its teeth are typical stegosaurus leaf shapes, and some of the teeth are very worn down, which might mean that stegosaurus did some serious chewing, which is unlike we see in a lot of other dinosaurs where we think they just swallowed the leaves and then had a gastric mill or something, basically chew after they swallowed it. Or it could mean that they were just eating rougher plants, and therefore it was wearing down their teeth a little bit more. Giffen also has a toothless tip to its beak, or in scientific parlance, the premaxilla is edentulous. <laughs> That's a good word. I think so. That's why I decided to include it. <laughs> uh, technically, Giffen is the northernmost Morrison Formation dinosaur that's been found to date, which also makes it the farthest north stegosaur found to date, although it was only found about 20 or 30 miles north of Gates. So really, the two of them combined for some very far north stegosaurs. Yeah, that's pretty good. 
A lot of good stuff comes out of that Morris information. Especially if you like stegosaurs or sauropods. Yeah, some of us do. <laughs> Speaking of sauropods, researchers at the Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin have been studying the way that sauropods, and specifically giraffe titan, because they have that great giraffe titan display, moved. Veronica Diaz Diaz led the project. It took about two years, and they said that they made 3D models with muscles and tendons using photogrammetry to digitize the fossils in their collection. And that included several chains of tail vertebrae. The team found that because Giraffe Titan had a short, robust tail, it may have used the muscles in its tail to help lift its back legs and to keep the tail from moving from side to side. They also found that sauropods with longer tails may have used them to communicate. Their tails were able to move more than Giraffe Titans. So in the future, the team wants to look at sauropod tail and hind limb muscles. Using them to communicate because they're more flexible. That's really, that seems like a stretch, but it is really interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, I suppose dogs do that, like wagging their tails. And then if you look at them closely, you can tell if it's wagging more to one side, that it means that they're happy. And if it's wagging more to the other side, it can mean that they're aggressive. Yeah, it could. I was thinking like how in cartoons sometimes and you see the tail do that, like, get over here kind of motion <laughs> oh like they're using it like a finger yeah to like point at things yeah <laughs> that would be pretty cool hey, who knows but it's fun to think about yeah in tibet Shinglida and a research team started a two-week expedition to study some recently found dinosaur footprints and these footprints were found last year by a few people from the chinese academy of sciences Tibet also has what they call a big footprint, and that's on a <laughs> cliff in Kamdo. And Shing said it was probably from a sauropod when it moved along a lake shore or a sea. I like that nickname, Big Footprint. Yeah. Near Blanding, Utah, there's a team of researchers excavating seven Diplodocus vertebrae, and they're going to go on display at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. It's going to be part of their new welcome center that opens in 2022. So, so far, the team has excavated 30 fossils over four weeks. Alyssa Bell, who's directing the fieldwork, said that the skeleton is known as Natalie. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's spelled with a G, G-N-A-T-A-L-I-E. And that's after the quarry where it was found. And its bones are green. And this is because of the minerals and the fossilization process in that quarry. So this dinosaur will technically be the first green dinosaur. Mm, that's cool. In other news, Jurassic Outpost posted about updates coming to the Jurassic World live show. There's going to be a Troodon, Stegosaurs, Triceratops, and T-Rex, and of course Velociraptor. The T-Rex is 43 feet long, and the dinosaurs are going to be controlled with joysticks and levels, and even the eyelids are going to be moving. So we're looking forward to when they announce dates for California. I keep checking every few weeks, and they still haven't. <laughs> The Disney Channel is getting the animated series Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. They have some promo art out, and that shows Lunella, the 13-year-old genius, sitting on her dinosaur and sipping a soda. There's not too many details yet, such as when it will air, but I'm sure it'll be coming out soon. For the gamers out there, Eurogamer has a pretty fun list of games with dinosaurs, so if you're looking for stuff, you can take a look. They include Thief, a dark project, which technically doesn't have dinosaurs, but they have these two-legged lizards with iguana heads. <laughs> Is Horizon Zero Dawn with the robot dinosaurs. Tomb Raider, the first game has a T-Rex. Yoshi, which of course is really cute. And John Woo's Stranglehold, which has a museum level where you run up a dinosaur spine. Huh, we haven't heard about that one before. No. And last I just saw a photo of the Oakland Raiders hanging out with Stan the T-Rex at Google's main office. I didn't know that Google had a Stan. It sounds vaguely familiar now that I'm talking about it, but I, I didn't know for sure. Everyone has a stand. Yeah. Maybe someday we'll get to see that stand. Travel around the world visiting Stan the T-Rex. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like a hundred of them. <laughs> Especially if you include skull only displays. Yes. And we've found him in a number of unexpected places. Yes. They are literally everywhere. <laughs> Probably on most continents. Yeah. And before we get into our interview with Peter... I want to quickly remind everybody that we have our Patreon. It helps us do everything that we do. We haven't had too many sponsors lately, so Patreon is what's keeping us going. So if you like the work that we're doing, especially some of the more laborious things like the Bone Wars or going to interview people or also our upcoming trip to Australia, which is pretty expensive. So if you join our Patreon, you can help us to do all of this great stuff and get recognition on the show or get access to ad-free versions of the show or premium content, Discord server, 
all sorts of stuff. So if you're interested, please head over to patreon.com slash I know dino. Yes. And we'll also be coming up with some cool extra rewards for our patrons soon for our upcoming trip to Australia because of all the SVP coverage. And now for our interview with Peter May. I'm here at Research Casting International with Peter May, the founder. And are you the CEO? Yeah. Founder, owner. Yeah. And yeah, we just walked through the whole facility, which is massive and full of tons of dinosaur goodies. Yeah. yeah. 50,000 square feet. Yeah. And then they're adding another room. So there's some background noise because they're building out yeah. a digital area, right? Yeah. Or a th- 3D studio is going in there. Yeah. Nice. In terms of major projects right now, you're kind of in between things because you just finished the yeah. Smithsonian yep. and Zool and yep. anything else that you finished recently? Um, University of Michigan. I just finished that down there. What did they have? They opened a whole new museum. Oh, about, really? About three, four weeks ago. Yeah. Wow. They, they closed down the old museum and we moved a bunch of stuff into the new museum and did some new mounts for them. It's been a, a busy year. You know, like just uh, all, all sorts of stuff going on. Now we're just pausing, you know, mm-hmm. taking a deep breath, and then we'll get back. Yeah, because last year we did uh, the new exhibits in uh, Cincinnati. They opened a new hall there. They renovated the new the, the museum, the old uh, train station. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's just gorgeous, a gorgeous facility. So we did that in Michigan and uh, Smithsonian. The Field Museum, the new uh, exhibit there for uh, Sue. We moved Sue from downstairs to upstairs. Did you make yeah. their Patago Titan as well? No, we didn't. That's all our molds, though. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Now, now the Argentinians decided that they could do it themselves. Gotcha. We did the, the first one. We developed the skeleton you know, and took molds off it all and then mounted the first one. And, and their people came up here and learned how to do it. And then they, they did the one for, for the Field Museum. Nice. Get some expertise in country that way. That'd be yeah. good. Yeah. With Patago Titan, did you guys do... Because it came from a lot of individuals, right? Did you guys figure out how to make it look like a real dinosaur from the yeah. hodgepodge of individuals? Yeah, we, we took, you know, they had, uh, I think it was six individuals, different sizes. Mm-hmm. And uh, what we did, we scanned everything they took out. You know, so we had a good, I guess, section of the bones. We had pretty well every bone of a skeleton that we could use. And then we just sort of um, scaled everything. And we, we worked with uh, the guys down there, um, Diego, Paul, and uh, Jose, they're paleontologists who worked on it. And we worked very closely with them and made some changes. Like the first time they had the skull, it was way too big. <laughs> they had this massive skull. <laughs> no, 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 it's a little too big you know, for sauropods. So then we went back and forth a few times. So the, the first, I don't know if the one they have down there might have the big head on it. And then we went back for the M&H and said the skull might be a little bit too big. So yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, we went with the smaller one. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the thing with sauropods. Their heads are always a lot smaller than you expect for the size of the yeah. rest of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's just amazing too. Like we, we're doing a dippy now for the uh, the steam exhibit up here at Queen's University in a couple weekends from now. And I had the skull with me and it's just little peg-like teeth and there's no <laughs> nothing to chew with. Like at, at the back, it, like all they do, they could strip the leaves and then swallow the leaves and then just going through the whole thing then they started to eat rocks to help digest food and they got to figure which one was the first one to eat a rock and then how do you tell all the other ones that the stomach felt better if you ate rocks <laughs> yeah <laughs> like you know, how does that sort of stuff get passed around all the other all the other dinosaurs are like why is that one eating rocks <laughs> yeah <laughs> or, you know, and we're, we're just burping and belching and not doing that anymore <laughs> yeah it's pretty crazy yeah cool were there any dinosaurs that you worked on between uh cleveland and michigan or Cincinnati, sorry, Michigan. It's the a H T-Rex exhibits. We did the a H skeleton. We did a skeleton of Scotty for Saskatchewan. Oh, cool. Because that just came out, the description on Scotty, the new description, even though it's been around <laughs> quite a while. Yeah, it yeah. like I think it wasn't actually officially described anywhere, right? Like they had it yeah. and it was named, nicknamed and everything, but it just... I remember when it was first found, it was, uh, we're working on the rearing barasaur at the A&H. Hmm. So early 90s. They first found in a Tim Tkarik. He, he's out of the East End, and he's the one who found it and collected it. I remember there was a trip, and Gene Gaffney would have been at the AMH, and the whole pilot pilot went to see the site, and it was just lying there. And, uh, <laughs> Gene said it was like a car wreck. 
<laughs> just all like all jumbled up. Yeah, but, but it's turned out like it, it's a very impressive skeleton. Like it, it's as big as Sue. Wow. It's a, easily like it's a massive T-Rex. Yeah, I yeah. think I was I was looking at the size of it or the description of it and it had about the same number of lags. It was like 28 to low 30s lags and on the forums online, of course, everybody's like, well, you know, which one's bigger? What's the biggest? Everyone wants to know what's biggest. And it's like, it's a, it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> they're both no, they're, huge. They're pretty close. We, had, we yeah. had them here at the same time a few years ago. And I think all I could do is go on the circumference of the femur, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like that's, an, and to me, they're almost identical. Like they're not yeah. far off at all. I think Scotty's was like ever so slightly bigger. Yeah. And that was, it might have even become the title of the paper, like biggest T-Rex or oh, something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. But yeah, they're both just so huge. Yeah. This might be the only place you've ever had both of them then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember we had three at the time. I think we had <laughs> MR555 as well. Like, so, so we had 555, we had Sue and Scotty. That's really cool. Yeah. You know, so it's, yeah. You walk among, this is a picture somewhere, but I don't know where. That was quite a few years ago. Yeah. Are those, because those were mounted so long ago, are those the mounts where the they kind of went through the bone with the steel or is it on the outside? A lot of it's external. Okay. Yeah. The um, I think most of it, the, there's not a lot that's internal on it. I think I saw one you guys worked on where you were going from internal and you had the steel going through the skeleton. You had to deal with the complexity of that because then when you take it out, mm-hmm. you have to be careful that it stays yeah. together. Yeah, because even you know, my career, like in the early part of the career, we used to core everything. Mm. You know, like when we built um, Trail Museum, we you know, like that would have been mid '80s, still coring bone, and putting the steel through. It, you know, <laughs> but now, now I don't, I don't think anyone does it anymore. It'd be sacrilege. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and even on the whales, you know, now they want external armature on the whales. Really? Well. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and it's all from a, a conservation point of view. Yeah, you know, like the. Uh, we have one whale skull on this cord, and, and and the other one's all external. So, it all, all depends on the on the museum or the university that's you know has the mount. Yeah, because to me, it's like if it's a living animal, you know, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> but I suppose yeah. whales, you don't get a lot of opportunities to look at their skeletons, so I no. could understand that. No, and they are becoming more and more important. Yeah, so for just, sure. Uh, as they die out, you know, and thousands of other animals today that are just sort of. On the edge of their their lives, I guess. Yeah, you said you have a couple blue whales right now here too, right? Yep. Yeah, we we collected two in uh, 2014. They they drowned in the the Gulf of Saint Lawrence. Hmm. It was a cold winter, and they're in. Uh, they, they had a, a hole in the ice, and then slowly the, the hole closed up, oh. and the, and they couldn't swim far enough to get to get air. So they all, I think, about about nine of them died. Wow. Yeah. And That's we, sad. We collected two of them, and we went out for a third one, but we were just a bit too late. The storm came and washed it out back out to sea. Gotcha. I'm surprised there are enough museums around that have space for a whale. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a tough one. We, we have a traveling exhibit here that's ready to go, but not everyone can fit a 75-foot blue whale <laughs> in the hole. Right. <laughs> so the one that you mounted in um, the Natural History Museum in London, mm-hmm. you hung have you done any others that are hanging? We're doing one for Memorial University out, out in St. John's, Newfoundland. And uh, it'll be hanging, but it's going up. <laughs> like it's sort of breaching. You know, a little bit of a twist to it. Nice. Yeah, because yeah, the one in Natural History Museum in London is kind of diving down. Yeah. So you yeah. almost look it in the face when you come through the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they just had a die-off there. And here they, the extinction oh, revolution. You've heard about that. They're going through the UK last little while. And they had a, um, a, a die-off under the blue whale. No. All, these, all these people died. Then they went up to Glasgow and they had a die-off under Dippy. <laughs> so I don't know if it's the same group or not, but I imagine it was a, a group out of Scotland went to Glasgow and, the, and they had a, a die-in, I guess they call it. <laughs> and everyone just sort of lies down and pretends they're dead. It's like a very like low-energy flash mob. Yeah. Just yeah. Lays down. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other projects upcoming? Um we have, we have other ones, but I can't really talk about them. Okay. They're all in the works. You know, Top so secret. A, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's other stuff. We'll, we'll be busy. We're, we're going to have a very busy year, you know, but we're in a nice, nice space right now where we can get organized mm-hmm. and, and just get all our, all our planning done. Oh, yeah. And everybody can catch up on their days off and 
worked me over time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then the other thing I should mention is you're going to open a museum here too. It's in the works. Yep. And it'll probably be about four or five years from now. We're in the early stages and it'll probably be life through time, punctuated by extinction events. Then we just have to see where we end up, you know, like because it is the current topic right now in mm -hmm. a lot of science museums. You know, just on this uh, Anthropocene, you know, what's going on now with what we're doing to the world. Yeah. You know, how, how it's affecting animals and things like that. One thing we know for sure, the world will survive. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's right. <laughs> we may not as hominids, you know, like may not yeah. do as well as we, as we are now. But. I like to think that dinosaurs are going to re-inherit the earth because we have birds on every continent and yeah. they're so resilient, especially things you got like ravens and gulls and things that seem like they can eat about anything. Yep. <laughs> the insects will probably pull through. Yeah, you know. true. Yeah, beetles are pretty hard to wipe out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for your museum, how much of your how much of your warehouse is it going to take up? Do you know about like percentage wise? Uh, well, but we're fifty thousand square feet, and it'll probably we'll probably have twenty five thousand square feet, but it'll be on two stories. So okay, we'll have about um, about eight eight thousand square feet. Will be two storied, so it'll be sixteen, then another ten on top of that. Okay, and you're still gonna have enough space for all your projects? You think? Well, I think so. Yeah, we can always expand. We got land that way. We can put a building. Okay, good. <laughs> what we've got is the molding casting area, you know, which um, has, has its own special properties, like the fumes and everything else. You know, it's easy enough to move that outside. And then we, I don't think we'd be able to have that in a museum environment anyway, just for health and safety reasons. You know, and, and the cement. You know, we, we we do a lot of cement work, and there's a lot of dust, and we'll move that out as well. So we'll move the the fumes and the cement outside and the foundry the bronze foundry will probably move out as well so what we'll have here is mainly a, a mounting area and we'll do f fossil preparation and conservation and mounting nice you've mentioned a couple things to me when we were walking around about what would be in the museum so i know you said you have a raptor potentially from jurassic park yeah the original might go in that yeah. you could stick in there <laughs> we'll see you know because yeah it's an old thing and there's other things to put in there, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, I, don't, I don't know if we'll do any of the pop, pop dinosaur stuff or not, you know, yeah. the early stage of storyline, you know, so we're moving through and uh, we'll have a kid's area and, and you know, the augmented reality and things like that. Like, I'd like to bring some of that into it. Nice. That'd be really great. Yeah. We went up to the Philip J. Curry Museum. Have you seen their augmented yeah, reality yeah, things? There. Yeah. They got some neat stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the ROM had some for their, their dinosaur exhibit. And the, the fellows came through here when we we're building, and they, uh, yeah, they're using a, a tablet. We can mm -hmm. hold the tablet up, and yeah, it all comes to life. That's great. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to show me around and okay, talk Garrett, to me about what you. you're working on. Yeah, thank you. It's good. Thanks again, Peter. I kind of ambushed him because years ago he offered that if we were ever near Toronto, we could check out Research Casting International. So after several years of him offering that, I emailed them like, hey. I'm coming to Toronto. Hope you don't mind a visitor. Remember when you when you offered to show us around? <laughs> and it was a really great visit. It's a little bit of a drive outside of Toronto, but Mayu just mentioned on our Discord that you can head over there on September 14th if you're in the area because they're going to have an open house, which is the only time of year that they're open to the public. I think it's like Ontario Day, or it has some similar themed <laughs> name like that, where lots of businesses open up to the public. So if you want to check out some of the stuff that I saw, assuming it's still there, then head over there. Or you might see some of the new stuff because they're constantly getting new work because they do such a great job. I also shared a bunch of pictures on the Discord server. For those of us who didn't get to go. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Sabrina. <laughs> So if you're a patron, then definitely go on there and check them out. There's some really cool things in there. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Coronasaurus, which was a request from Dinosaur 4602. So thanks. It was a Lambiosaurine hadrosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now China, and it's estimated to be about 33 feet or 10 meters long. It's one of the largest known hadrosaurs from Asia. Scientists found a partial skull in parts of an adult and juvenile, and the partial skull looks like a Parasaurolophus. Coronasaurus probably had a long, hollow crest like Parasaurolophus, and this helps show that Lambiosaurines lived later than their relatives in North America, because it lived later than Parasaurolophus. The type species is Coronasaurus giayanensis. It was found in 2000 by Godfrey, Zan, and Jin on the south bank of the Amur River, which divides China and Russia. 
and the genus name means Caron's lizard. It refers to Caron, the ferryman who took souls from the river Styx to the land of the dead, and it's named because the dinosaur was found on the river that borders China and Russia. I don't think it's saying anything about China or Russia. It's just the fact that it was on a river. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, that's a dark reference. Yeah. That's the river you pick. <laughs> <laughs> the species name, of course, refers to Jiayin, the locality where it was found. And our fun fact of the day is that if you love stegosaurs, the Morrison Formation in the U.S. is the place to be. This is based on a bunch of information from Paleobio database, which unfortunately only includes published finds. So there could be some missing data, but I think it's a pretty good way of telling where the most common things are, or where the most frequent occurrences of things are. And on it, the U.S. has way more stegosaurs than any other country. It's not even close. There's over 80 published studies about stegosaur finds. And the next closest is actually Tanzania, which was really surprising to me because we were just talking about how Africa doesn't have as much paleontology going on as other places. But then when I looked into it, it was obvious in retrospect because it's the Tendaguru Formation, which is where Kentrosaurus is from. And there've been over a thousand bones of Kentrosaurus found in the Tendaguru Formation, mostly in the early 1900s by German researchers. And most of them ended up in Berlin at the Natural History Museum there. But a lot of them were destroyed in World War II. So I'm guessing that Tanzanian Kentrosaurus bones aren't as prominent as they once were, which might make China the second best place now to find stegosaur bones because we're constantly finding new stegosaurs there along with tons of other new dinosaurs. And then there's a decent showing in Western Europe with Spain probably coming in third or fourth, and the UK also has a good number, and then it drops pretty far down after Portugal. There's a couple in Australia, and then, yeah, lots of countries in South America with just like one stegosaur. But the US, really the place to be for stegosaurs, and China's probably a pretty good place too. And both those countries are kind of good for dinosaurs in general. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, stegosaurs <laughs> are relatively uncommon compared to other dinosaurs, sort of like ankylosaurs. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And don't forget to listen to next week when we celebrate our 250th episode with the Bone Wars. And if you like what you hear, well, consider joining our community, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Good day.